In the first hours of April 12, 1861, men stare anxiously at Fort Sumter while sitting in the Charleston Harbor. Lieutenant Farley of the newly formed Confederate States walks up to a mortar and lights it. Thus begins the Civil War, started over the right of states to allow the purchase and selling of slaves. In a war that would last for four years and would claim the lives of 750,000 soldiers, a regiment of Hoosier soldiers would fight and die to preserve the United States of America. This is the story of the men of the 19th Indiana, Iron Hoosiers. The reaction in Indiana after Fort Sumter had been fired upon was an overwhelming outburst of patriotism. You can kind of think of it this way. If someone were to come up and, and slap your mother in the face, your instant reaction is going to be, you're going to be upset, you're going to be mad, you want revenge. And it was kind of like the country had been slapped in the face. Um, Lincoln called up the militia, 75,000 troops, and in, Indiana's quota at that time was six regiments. And, and in less than a week, over 12,000 men had volunteered their services. They were coming in by, by the train loads almost to Indianapolis. Some of the uh, railroads were given free fare to the men that were going to join. The United States would always ask for Indiana troops because they came forward in such numbers. They were never short of their goals, always recruited more men than were possible in other states. The general makeup of the men of the 19th Indiana primarily were farmers. They had jobs that connected to farming like milling, mechanics, you know, 18 years old to 25 years old, some a little younger, some older. Abraham Buckles, he musters into the 19th Indiana, July of 61, 15 years old. He turns 16 soon after, but he's a young guy. And I, I think he's one of those guys that just can't sit still. He was very ambitious. Abraham Buckles and his fellow Hoosiers would be transported to Camp Morton in Indianapolis, now home to the state fairgrounds, where men would be transformed from civilians into soldiers. The regiment that became the 19th Indiana consisted of the standard 10 companies of 97 men and three officers. The companies were labeled A through K. Company A was from Madison County, B was from Wayne County, C from Randolph County, D and F from Marion County, E and K from Delaware County, G from Elkhart County, H from Johnson County, and I from Owen County. In total, 1,000 Hoosiers formed the 19th Indiana, training as companies and then a regiment before finally receiving training at the Army level. So there was a, a hierarchy of training. You had to have some kind of political pull to become a colonel or commander of a regiment. Those were generally appointed by the governor in Indiana. The idea was if somebody had some sort of military experience in their background, they would be considered for the higher offices. As the regiment was organized, the question of who would lead the regiment became a topic of much discussion. Ultimately, Governor Morton selected Solomon Meredith to be the colonel of the 19th Indiana. Sal Meredith was definitely an opportunist and knew absolutely nothing about the military. He was as raw as the men who signed up to serve under him. His joining the army, in his mind, was another advancement of his political career. He had been born in North Carolina, but had settled in Cambridge City, Indiana. He was the sheriff, elected sheriff, for a couple terms. He served in the Indiana State House in 18, I think it was 1849. He was appointed uh, U.S. Marshal for the state of Indiana. He served as the a county clerk for a while. So he was well connected politically and I believe he thought after the war if he had a good service record he could end up as governor, senator. It was just another step on a political career for him. As the newly formed 19th Indiana prepared to leave home, the regiment's battle flags were presented to the men and officers by the women of Muncie. The colors, the flags, were extremely important to the men of the regiment. That, that was the symbol of 
everything they believed in. That was a symbol of the country. It was a, it was a sacred item to those guys. And it would be a, like a big ceremony where they would present the flag to the, to the men and they would accept the flag and say that no rebel hand would ever, ever disgrace this flag and we'd bring it back in victorious glory and that kind of thing. They were carried in a line of battle in the middle so that troops in combat in the smoke and fury and uh, yelling and every, everything going on would have a place to look for, uh, to rally upon, to find their commanding officers there. You know, if that flag went forward, you went forward. You know, if it started going back, you went back. And when the soldiers were finally mustered in, in Indianapolis, July 61. Most of them hadn't left the state, I bet, because they were young guys and they took trains to Washington. Towns that they would go through in Indiana and Ohio and Pennsylvania, they'd go through towns and oftentimes they'd be greeted with crowds of people. And flags were flying and, you know, pretty ladies with their handkerchiefs are waving and they would give them free food. It was a thrill. And if one of the guys said, uh, it was more like we were returning war heroes and not green recruits. So it was exciting for them. The first Bull Run battle had ended a week before they mustered in. The Union had been beaten, and, and now they're heading to the seat of war. Well, let's see, being in Washington sucked. Tens of thousands of troops are flooding into the Capitol, and they were given their campsite, and the, con the, the sanitary conditions were horrible. Basically, open-ended tents where the rain could come in. If it's cold, you're cold inside. It was a case where disease became epidemic. And if it was bad enough, they'd send you to a hospital. And being in a hospital, oftentimes, there'd be people in there with measles, smallpox, mumps, and that would spread through the hospital. So a lot of guys died in D.C. When the regiment left Indianapolis, it was over 1,000 strong, with, including officers. By the time it went into first combat at Bronner Farm, it was down to 429 men. As the men of the 19th Indiana recovered, they were assigned to join the Western Brigade, which was made up of the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin regiments. In May of 1862, they were placed under the command of artilleryman John Gibbon. When it was time to get better trained leaders, and that's when he was promoted to Brigadier General and commanded what was become the Iron Brigade with the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin and 19th Indiana. I don't think the men cared for him very much at all. Gibbon was an 1847 graduate of West Point, and he was a, he was a military man, and he was going to make him do everything by the book. John Gibbon wanted his new brigade to look like the best troops in the Army, and he also wanted them to look like regular Army troops, so he ordered regular army uniforms for them, which included a black hardy hat, a frock coat, the regulation pants, and then white leather leggings. And he also ordered the complement that a regular army soldier would be issued. The soldiers were required to carry in their knapsacks. Obviously, when you're marching in 90 degree weather, uh, this is not something that you enjoy. So on one of the marches, uh, the men in the brigade, especially in the 19th Indiana, began to, began to throw away all of their extra clothing. Gibbon was incensed about the fact that the 19th Indiana especially had thrown away so many pieces of new uniform. And he basically called out Saul Meredith and said, you don't know what you're doing as a commander. I want this done and I want it rectified and I want you to do exactly what I tell you. And he insisted that one of the things the soldiers should do is wear the leggings. Soldier said, no, no, we're not gonna do it. And it very, very close to a mutiny. Gibbon said if they refused to show up the next morning without their leggings, that he would order his artillery to fire on their camp. Now this, this is serious stuff. But the next day, they failed to show up with their, their leggings just to show their continued arrogance towards their commanding officer. But just before they were able to form up on the parade and so Gibbon could uh, you know, follow through with his threat, there were cannons that started practicing in the distance and the 19th Indiana guys thought they're shooting at us so they all fell on the ground and 
then started to look around and think, oh, nobody got hit, what's going on? And then they realized it would have been somebody in the distance and uh, they got up and laughed it off. Gibbon realized he couldn't push his troops any further than he had already done. As the war began its second year, the new Union commander, George B. McClellan, took his Army of the Potomac on a campaign to take Richmond, Virginia. Troops were left behind to protect Washington, and the 19th Indiana was among McDowell's troops that stayed behind. As it turns out, McClellan's offensive against Richmond failed. As the Army of the Potomac is coming north, Lee and his troops from the Confederacy moved back up towards Washington and threatened Washington from the west. I believe as, as the troops were heading toward their very first major battle, the feeling had to be they were itching for a fight. They were ready to go. They had been in the Army for a little over a year, so they were, they were ready to prove what they said they could do. Confederates had taken up a position near Manassas, north of the Warrenton Turnpike, where they basically laid a trap for John Pope's army. On the afternoon of August 28th, 1862, Confederate artillery appeared north of the turnpike and began to fire on the columns as they, as they marched along. John Gibbon got his men into line, thought this was gonna be an easy score. He figured they were just light cavalry, horse cavalry, and he could just send his troops up there, drive them off, or maybe even capture a couple of the artillery pieces. So he sent his men up through a big patch of woods, and they found out once they got through the woods and got closer to the artillery that it was essentially uh, an infantry division in the Confederate army that was waiting for them at the top of the hill. The overall command was under the, the legendary Stonewall Jackson, and the first troops the Western men confronted was his old Stonewall Brigade, who had been uh, together since the first Bull Run. In the early days of the Civil War, battles were fought in the old-fashioned English and French way of lining up in parallel lines and firing at each other at a range of anywhere from 100 to 300 yards. It was really easy to hit somebody at that range with a rifled musket, which is why the casualty rate was so high. The firing started instantly and kept up for about three hours until long after dark. The bloodshed was incredible in a matter of three hours. It was one of the bloodiest fights in the entire war. Civil War fighting was not like fighting that's depicted in the movies or on television or in video games now. I mean, you got hurt in the worst possible ways. You could get shot in the testicles, you could get shot in the jaw. Everything is fair game. But the problem comes later when the wounded are taken to makeshift hospitals in stables and barns where infections get into the wounds. And the, the rate of uh, mortality among some of the wounded is, is terrible. One unique, unfortunate case on Bronner Farm was with Major May of Company A. He took a mortal head wound in that battle and a couple soldiers after he passed away buried him. Seth Pedden was one from the 19th that buried him and a Wisconsin soldier and they knew where he was buried. Well those two soldiers ended up dying in battle later in the war and, and Major May's grave has never been found. Abraham Buckles, he was wounded at the Battle of Bronner Farm, uh, slightly wounded. Um, he always wanted to carry the flag. He always wanted to be the flag bearer. Once the Battle of Bronner Farm was over, so to speak, I think primarily most of the men, first off, you're going to be exhausted, tired, you're dirty, you're thirsty, you're hungry. You, you got to imagine that your, your adrenaline was up to here when you went in and when you come off that adrenaline rush. That, that would be your initial feelings and to, that you're alive, you survived that thing. The 19th was ignored three orders to leave the field. They, they, they kept fighting. Some of the guys didn't want to quit. Some were upset that, that they left the field. It's like, why, why did we spill so much blood for nothing? If you had to uh, declare a winner at Bronner Farm, it would have to have been the Western troops because the, it was their first fight. 
They were up against trained Confederate troops who outnumbered them probably two to one. They held their ground and they fought them to a standstill. The problem was afterwards, the division commander thought he was totally isolated and away from the army. So the first thing he did that evening was abandon the battlefield. The federal troops leave the Bronner Farm battlefield. They march to Manassas Junction where they join up with the rest of uh, John Pope's army. Then they go forward and are involved in the second bull run on August 30th. They, they were definitely under artillery fire. They were involved in some musketry, but mostly uh, they were not actively involved like they were at Bronner Farm. After Second Bull Run, they become part of the retreat to Washington. Following the Battle of Second Manassas, General McClellan takes the remnants of General Pope's army, including the 19th Indiana, and incorporates it into the Army of the Potomac and begins the long march after General Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia. So it's a, a foot chase to see who can get into Maryland and find the best position in which to fight a battle. Once the Army of the Potomac started into Maryland, they thought that there was a possibility, distinct as it turned out, that Lee could go all the way into Pennsylvania and they would be fighting on free soil. So essentially, you could sum up the Army of the Potomac's attitude was they were going north after Lee to kick his ass. In order to reach General Lee, the Army of the Potomac would first have to take and cross over South Mountain. South Mountain is essentially a mountain that bisects Maryland, and Lee used that as a rear guard as he was going farther up north. Gibbon's brigade was assigned the task of following the National Road, which crossed South Mountain at its peak, and driving off the Confederate defenders there. The Confederates had all the advantages of the height. They had the advantage of more men. They had the advantage of, they had cannons in place, but the, the men of Gibbon's brigade uh, started up the hill and refused to stop until they'd driven the Confederates from the battlefield. Again, against seasoned troops in Lee's army from somebody who had only been in combat a few days before. The 19th Indiana moved up the National Road on the left and pushed back the Confederates, they got in a position where they could have a flanking fire to help drive them from one of their best positions. Isaac Branson at uh, South Mountain, he took a bullet to the back of his head, an inch and a half behind his right ear. He was shot, knocked him down. He stumbled down the mountain, got back to his feet, stumbled down the mountain to the uh, aid station, and it healed up. And the man died in 1897 with that bullet still in his head. As Gibbon's brigade advanced under fire up South Mountain, apparently, uh, George McClellan, the Army commander, and Joseph Hooker, the Corps commander that Gibbon's brigade was in, were watching the fighting from the, uh, the bottom of the hill, or the bottom of the mountain. And in their interchange back and forth, McClellan was praising Hooker for his troops, and one of the other, depending on who you listen to and whose sources you believe, said something about, yeah, they're the best troops we have, they must be made of iron. And that's where they got the nickname of the Iron Brigade that stuck throughout the war. After South Mountain, the way for the Army of the Potomac to follow Lee's army was open. Gibbon's brigade basically led the advance and was one of the first units to arrive on what would become the scene of the fighting at uh, Antietam two days later. September 17th, 5.30 a.m. As the dawn rises over the small town of Sharpsburg, a tense silence is interrupted with the thunder and roar of cannon fire. This is the Battle of Antietam, and the Iron Brigade is about to enter hell on earth. The 19th Indiana was one of the first regiments involved at the Battle of Antietam on September 17th of 1862. It was a gory spectacle. It was worse than you could even imagine as far as uh, a hellish place to live. 
and try to stay alive. The 19th Indiana was led into an ill-judged charge. They thought, Lieutenant Colonel Bachman thought that he saw an advantage in, uh, in moving forward and outflanking another Confederate unit. As they lined up to make their charge, the proper place for the Lieutenant Colonel was behind the line to lead things, to oversee, like the Colonel and the Major would be as well. His orders were no longer forward, but follow me, and he ended up getting killed. When he went over the crest of a hill, he found out there was another brigade that he hadn't seen that just uh, said, oh, here come some Yankees, let's shoot them to shit. Probably a hundred of them were shot down in a matter of uh, 10 minutes. By the time the Battle of Antietam was over, there were only about 60 men left in the regiment, down from 429 who had entered Bronner Farm roughly 20 days earlier. Now, Robert I. Patterson, Company E, he got blown off a fence. When he came to, he, he didn't know how bad he was hurt. He went over to the Miller Farm and sat down up against the house, and uh, there was a soldier next to him that, was, that had a, uh, a, a chest wound, really bad chest wound, and he didn't think he was gonna live. It looked awful, and it turned out to be Andrew Ribble from Company K, a guy from Delaware County. After Antietam, both sides basically took a time out. Uh, in December, the uh, Confederate Army had taken up a position at Fredericksburg, Virginia. The Army of the Potomac went down and began an assault against their entrenched lines. And for once, the Iron Brigade and the uh, 19th Indiana were spectators more than anything else. By, by the end of 1862, most of the men in the Army of the Potomac, including the 19th Indiana, had lost confidence in their, in their leaders and their generals. Uh, nothing had been accomplished. They were at a stalemate. Nothing had been done other than to lose immense amount of men, uh, equipment, treasure, and they were hoping for better luck in 1863. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln would sign the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all slaves currently held in the rebellious southern states. While celebrated by African Americans and abolitionists across the country, the men of the 19th Indiana were less than thrilled. When the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was made known to the soldiers of the 19th Indiana, when they found out about it, the response was they were not for it at all. They, really upset a lot of them. They, they had joined the army to save the Union. It's like they had changed the rules for the war in the middle of the game. I would guess that in Company G of the 19th in the end, there wasn't a single man who had ever seen a black person because there were no black people in their county. I mean, there were probably very few pure abolitionists you know, within the ranks. There were some, I think, but not too many. Solomon Meredith apparently was very much against the Emancipation Proclamation. I think Solomon Meredith's opinion on the Emancipation Proclamation was based primarily on his South Carolina upbringing. The feeling amongst the men on the Emancipation Proclamation and why, possibly why they were so against it, uh, you, you gotta understand the, the time frame of, the, of history. At that time, it was not unusual for people up north to think that the black race was an inferior race. It's obviously ridiculous. A lot of the guys believe that slavery was evil. You know, it, it should not be around, but that's for another day to decide, I think. Part of it might have been some innate racism, but one thing to remember is after the war, there had been over a hundred regiments of black soldiers enlisted under the title of the United States Colored Troops. One of the things that is grossly overlooked in our history is the fact that when the white soldiers began to organize and formulated uh, the Grand Army of the Republic and had individual posts to get together for reunions and, and you know, just social activities, they generally allowed black veterans to join ahead of where the black population was generally. Following the disastrous battles of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, morale in the army was strong, though men began to lose faith in the generals who led them. 
There would be little time to consider that as General Lee began his second invasion of the North. So he heads the Army of Northern Virginia up into Pennsylvania. This time he's going to Pennsylvania. He's not going to stop in Maryland. And the Army of the Potomac, now under Joseph Hooker, the unsuccessful commander at Chancellorsville, follows, but does a very good job of keeping up with Lee rather than letting him get a big head start. Just days before they catch up with the uh, Confederates at Gettysburg, Joseph Hooker is replaced as head of the Army of the Potomac by George Meade. Dawn, July 1st, 1863. A Confederate brigade marches down the road toward Gettysburg. All is quiet. Suddenly, rifle and cannon fire erupts on the Confederates from ridges outside of town. Union cavalry, having taken up defensive positions, are determined to hold the advancing rebels. General John Reynolds of the Union First Corps began to march his forces as quickly as possible. The 19th Indiana and the Iron Brigade, recently reinforced with the 24th Michigan Infantry, are marching toward immortality. As morning turns to afternoon, the Confederate generals realize what they are up against and deploy more men, slowly overwhelming the small cavalry force. As Confederate infantry begin to exit McPherson's woods, they are felled by infantry fire. As the smoke clears from the volley, the Confederate infantry realize to their horror who had fired on them. There are those damn black-headed fellas again. One Confederate soldier is reported to have said, "'Tain't no militia, it's the Army of the Potomac." Officers had gone up into uh, Cupola and the Gettysburg Seminary and where they could see for, for miles in the distance, and there was nobody coming to help them at that time. So the only thing they could do was hold out as long as they could and keep their fingers crossed and hope the rest of the Army arrived. I, I would say they were probably outnumbered three to one by the time uh, the afternoon came around. The, uh, the Iron Brigade went into uh, Gettysburg with 1,883 men and suffered 1,212 casualties. Some regiments lost 70 to 80 percent of their, their force. Robert I. Patterson, he was sent out on the skirmish line, and this is in the afternoon, and he was exchanging shots with the rebel skirmishers, and he gets shot in the ankle. Not real bad, but shot in the ankle. And he, he takes a beat on a, a rubble skirmisher and, and shoots, but he purposely didn't want to kill the guy. He was very close to him. So he shot him in the leg. He didn't want to kill him. Um, and he said that was the only time in the war that he ever saw the effect of one of his mini balls. Abraham Buckles got his chance at Gettysburg when, when the flag went down. He actually was able to pick it up and carry the flag. And in doing so, he got shot in the shoulder and he got busted up pretty good in the shoulder. He recovered from that wound. A lot of guys were killed carrying that flag, both flags. Sergeant Crockett East, he's from Delaware County. Toward the end of the battle, when the, when the troops were falling back to what they called the, the final stand, the last stand, the, the flag went down, one of the flags went down. And Lieutenant Macy ordered somebody to go get the flag and that somebody he told to go get it said, I'm not doing it. Too many men have been killed getting that thing. So Crockett East went with Macy to go get the flag. As soon as Crockett picked it up, and he, I think he was going to put it in the shuck, he gets shot and killed. And Macy had to, to pull the flag up from under his body to get the flag and retreat back up, uh, up to the, uh, the last stand. I, I think the 19th Indiana's crowning achievement, a lot of people would say, and it would be hard to disagree, would be their performance on July 1st, 1863 at Gettysburg. 288 men going into battle. At the end of it, they had 78 men that, that were still um, able to shoulder a musket. They fought off, as well as everybody else on that field, they, in the Iron Brigade. They held off Lee's army as long as they could and gave Meade time to bring up the rest of the Army of the Potomac. Once they were driven from west of Gettysburg, they went to Cemetery Hill. From there, they were sent to Culp's Hill, where they stayed for the rest of the battle. So once they had 
sacrifice themselves on the first day, they basically got to be spectators. I, I can only think that after Gettysburg, the survivors on, on Culp's Hill, again, probably felt lucky to be alive still. Um, they, were, they were hardened, hardcore veterans by that time. They knew the realities of war and they had survived and they probably felt very happy about that obviously, but it was just the reality of war. They, I think they'd gotten probably used to the losses almost. It'd be odd to say, but I think they did. Well, many historians look at Gettysburg and the almost simultaneously surrender of uh, Vicksburg on the Mississippi as the high point of, of the war. From there on, the Confederates were never able to establish another invasion of the North. They were always on the defensive from then on out. And uh, the 19th Indiana was a, an important part of that by holding their position on the first day. The two armies had basically fought themselves out at Gettysburg and no one had really an interest in having another confrontation like that, at least until the spring of 1864. It's, it's fair to say that what the Iron Brigade did, along with the 19th Indian and the other individual regiments, what they did on the morning and afternoon of July 1st saved the battlefield for uh, George Meade's Army of the Potomac which resulted in the ultimate Gettysburg victory and a turning point in the entire war. As 1863 turned to 1864, the Union Army began to realize that there was about to be a massive problem in their ranks. Well, I personally think that January 1st of 1864 was the turning point for the entire war. Um, the, the volunteers from 1861 were going to have their enlistments expired in the summer of 1864. The last thing the Lincoln administration wanted was for all these trained soldiers to go home. So they came up with a plan to keep them in the ranks and they were really devious in the way they went about it because first of all, they offered a $300 enlistment to every man who would re-enlist. And for a private who's making $13 a month, $300 is a ton of money. But to make it even more insidious, if the regiment enlisted 75% of its members, they would all be sent home for a month. So I think the men that were left, that re-enlisted, three, over three quarters of them did, did it because they wanted to finish what they started. They weren't going to give up yet. They had gone through so much and sacrificed so much and saw so many of their friends killed and wounded and maimed and they had to finish it. Because the army had become their home. Their families were not their families anymore. It was the guys that stood beside you, the guys you could trust and depend on. The troops that were coming back home on their 30-day furlough arrived in Indianapolis in early January and they were uh, given a reception uh, the following day and the city turned out and packed the place out for them and, and made them feel like returning heroes. From what I understand that when the troops did come home on their furlough, uh, probably the officers, they had a duty and, and probably some of the higher enlisted men to, to do some recruiting, kind of kind of fill up the ranks again. And I believe it was a very tough thing to do because not too many of those local guys wanted to get into it. They knew what war was like. They knew what the 19th Indiana was about. Following their furlough, the men of the 19th Indiana returned to the front lines. When they got there, they found that they had a new commander of their army. The big change in 1864 is that there's now a new overall commander of the United States Army, which is General Ulysses Grant. He is going to make his headquarters with the Army of the Potomac, which is still commanded by General Meade. But Grant wants to be where the important things are t transpire. So he is going to conduct an overland campaign against Richmond. I think the men appreciated the fact that Grant was in command. They admired and respected Grant because they thought he would be the man that would end the war. He is going to have a campaign that's going to start and continue until the war is over. And that's what they wanted more than anything.
Determined to bring about the end of the Confederacy once and for all, General Grant began advancing his men to destroy the Army of Northern Virginia. Under this new management, the 19th Indiana would see action at the Battle of the Wilderness. Noticeably absent from the 19th Indiana and Iron Brigade was General Solomon Meredith, who, after being wounded again at Gettysburg, was removed from command. He would never again lead the Iron Brigade. Again, the wilderness is another place where the Indiana regiments lose significantly. They're part of the initial attack by the Fifth Corps, and significantly, this is the first time the 19th Indiana, you could say, gets smart and turns around and runs when they're overwhelmed instead of making a stand and losing men for no reason. The, the men of the 19th Indiana, after the wilderness, decided they're going to take some control of their own lives. Abraham Buckles was the flag bearer at the Battle of the Wilderness, and he carried the flag in that battle. And there's a point in there where they had just got done doing a lot of uh, running and, and charging and whatnot, and they were taking a, a breather, kind of, kind of catch their breath, and I think they were in an open area, and they were taking a lot of fire from some uh, rebels and some thickets in front of them. And he, he looked around and couldn't find an officer to give a command to, to, to charge them. So he took it upon himself to do that. And he charged with that flag, and he knew the guys were gonna follow him, and they did. And as they were charging that, those rebels, he got shot, shot right through the chest, in the front, out the back. He goes down, but he keeps the flag up. Abraham Buckles received the Medal of Honor for his actions at the Battle of the Wilderness. The Wilderness battle itself turns out to be just another bloody stalemate. But like I mentioned earlier, instead of just retreating and regrouping his army, Grant moved south. For, for once in their lifetime, the Army of the Potomac had gotten ahead of the Army of Northern Virginia. So they arrived at the James River before the rebel army could get there. They were able to cross and draw up an attack plan for Petersburg, but were unable to carry through it. At Petersburg, the 19th Indiana would see relatively little combat, remaining in their trenches for most of the siege. However, the 19th Indiana's time in the Iron Brigade was about to come to an end. The biggest thing that happened to them in late 1864 was the consolidation of all of the Indiana regiments in the Army of the Potomac. The men of the 19th Indiana were appalled at this. They fought it all the way up to, including the Secretary of uh, War. These guys fought so hard. I mean, that flag, that 19th Indiana flag, their flag, that was, that was sacred to them. They fought for that flag. But the Army being the Army, uh, an order is an order, and they had to comply. And it turned out that the first raid that they went on uh, with their new troop, with, with their new organization, uh, a lot of men from the 19th Indiana just walked away and went back to uh, the Iron Brigade because they refused to serve there. And they only went back to the new regiment, which was called the 20th after it was consolidated. They only went back at the point of a bayonet. Now part of the 20th Indiana, the men of the former 19th Indiana would continue to serve in important combat roles after the siege at Petersburg ended in 1865. The soldiers of the 20th Indiana were part of the pursuit of the Army of Northern Virginia after it evacuated P Petersburg. So they were in the chase to Appomattox Courthouse where the rebel army would have ultimately surrender. I think the guys that had survived so much, again, just wanted to see this thing over. They wanted to be there to see it surrender. They wanted to see Lee surrender. On April 9, 1865, a lone Confederate officer approaches the Union lines. Through the fog, a white linen dish rag flies from a pole. This begins the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia, which finishes later that day when General Lee formally surrenders to General Grant. It's just jubilation. Um, they're glad the war is over. They're more than happy that they've survived. Um, and a lot of the men 
in the regiment at the time had been wounded several times and had come back to the ranks to fill out, fill out their, their service. As the men of the 19th Indiana left the train station in Indianapolis, one can only wonder what they imagined life would be like for them after the war. Well, I, I guess the best way to say it is they came home and they put on their big boy pants and went to work. They didn't ask for any charity. There was a, a really rough adjustment to civilian life. John Nicholson, Company E, died in prison. He ended up murdering a man late in life. Isaac Hughes had been wounded and I believe lost an arm, came back to Muncie and was murdered after he was flirting with the wrong girls at a bar, I think. Austin Falk, Company F, was stabbed to death at a 4th of July thing in Indianapolis on, in 1867, a couple years after the war. Some of the guys a lot of, just went back to farming, just went back to the family farm. There was, in, in uh, Muncie, Indiana, three of the guys became preachers. Um, Henry Marsh, William Nelson Jackson, Oliver Carmichael, they all became preachers. Oliver Carmichael, he served four years in the Indiana State House uh, later in life and he was the first one to introduce a bill in Indiana for women's suffrage. And he lived long enough to see the 19th Amendment pass. Boy, William Wade Dudley, the guy who lost a leg at Gettysburg, he ended up being appointed commissioner of pensions by uh, President Garfield. Robert I. Patterson of Company E, Corporal Bob, he became a pension attorney and he handled over 7,000 cases, claims in, in uh, Muncie, Indiana. He was the, for a while, the senior vice commander of the G GAR in Indiana. He was a poet, he was an inventor. Abraham Buckles, he goes to law school and he ends up being a superior court judge in California. There was a number of men that, that committed suicide after the war. You know, life just went on. Some of it good, some of it not so good. The, the logical spokesperson for the Iron Brigade after the Civil War would have been Solomon Meredith. But he was a man of conscience and because he supported the administration of Andrew Johnson after the Lincoln assassination, he was shunned by a lot of Republicans. Even though the 19th Indiana may not have had the prominent spokesperson it deserved after the war, its importance and memory remain integral to telling the story of the Civil War. You know, I, I think the 19th Indiana's most significant contribution to the Union would, would clearly have to be all the men that died fighting that war, all the men that lost limbs, that were permanently disabled for the rest of their lives. Uh, I, I don't know, that. to me that that is, what more can you give to your country than that? And, and they they did what they said they were gonna do. I think why the 19th Indiana is selected as, as an epitome of an Indiana regiment is the fact the casualties they suffered and still remained an integral part of the army. They never gave up, no matter how desperate the situation was, no matter how bad the leadership was, they still stuck it out and saved the Union. The 19th Indiana today should, should not be forgotten. The opposite side of the coin of how should they be remembered, let's not forget them. The least we can do is remember these guys for what they did. At least put a flag at his graveside on Memorial Day, Decoration Day. What is the legacy of the 19th Indiana in, in today? Is there one? Are you aware of one? That's what we're doing this for. Well, no. then, then you should answer this question. Fair enough. I mean... Why are we doing it? Because there's a story that needs to be told. It's a good story. Maybe that's the legacy. It's just a good story. Gonna lay down my burden Down by, down by the riverside Down, down by the riverside down.
down by the riverside, gonna lay down my burden. Down, down by the riverside and study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. No more. I ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Gonna lay down my sword and shield down, down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Go